So, John, tell me about uh, what you'd like to talk about. Um, well, I figured uh, my easiest jumping off point is at the, the point of introduction that I'm John Washbush and I'm a man without a congregation. Mm. Because as of two weeks ago, my congregation ceased to exist. And so that's uh, the easiest uh, jumping off point. Um, and which congregation was that? St. James, Milwaukee. So All right. our last formal Sunday service was October 1st. And that um, we will have what? Diocesan celebration of the ministry of the congregation over the 160 years of its life mm -hmm. on November 1st at 7 p.m. And so that open invitation to anybody who'd like to come and celebrate. It's a diocesan event, so it's open to all, kind of, all part of the congregation. Um, but that has made me think a lot about uh, well, where I'm going to go and what I will do in looking for a new congregation. Yeah. And that reflection led me to a life of, of church service things, because I realized that my first task before looking for a new congregation is to learn how to worship differently. Say more about that. I, I began my first service uh, liturgically, just as a, a youth server when I was in grade school. But I was elected to my first parish leadership position when I was 15. And shortly I will be 52. In that time period, I've had four years where I have not been in a position of parish leadership in some form or another. Wow. 14, 15, 16 different varieties. So uh, a lot of the, the cycling that Christ Church has, I've moved from position to position to position. But in my adult life, I have never been a member of a congregation where I haven't also had a responsibility in that congregation. And I'm not sure how that's going to live as I try and look for some place I have to learn to worship differently and not be looking for cues and learning for looking for making sure things are done and that they're happening. Yeah. That will be a challenge for me because part of my life away from the church is I work in a high school as a communication arts teacher. And I work in theater uh, as part of my co-curricular responsibilities. Oh, wow. And so I've looked at church service, particularly liturgical church service, like divine stage management. That um, mm. my job is to help, and the way that I prayerfully experience God is to be in service in the, the liturgy so that that liturgical experience will be even greater and, and more beneficial to other people who are there. Sometime a long, 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 long time ago, um, a priest friend of mine grossly oversimplified uh, simplified some liturgical theology and said, well, pretty much my, my, while I'm at church, I can do one of two things. I can either help make that more present to the people around me or hinder that. And huh. he, he was using it in acolyte training, so don't be a distraction. For sure. It was the second half of it. But that, that first portion I have thought about often in, in my life, and so liturgical service has been really important to me that way toward the goal of helping to make God more present to other people in that service. And then that moved out into parish leadership, trying to make God more present in our parish and make that parish more present in our community. And by extension, I bring God out into our community, doing all of those things. So as I listen to the groups that were here before me and in all kinds of different directions we could go, as um, Jonathan was talking about big things that are more formal in Madison and things that were going on at the scene, St. James had a legacy of doing these simple things that could be started by any group of people anywhere and trying to serve uh, God's people in, in simpler ways. So simple things like collecting hotel toiletries and trying to get them to people out as we travel. Yeah. Uh, being present when the, the most poor in, in Milwaukee County were being buried and no one would be there with them as the county buried them. And just being, even just silently present at the gravesite as they're being interred. You know, those sorts of things are don't require huge structures and they don't require massive organizational programs and they don't require capital campaigns, but they are equally God's service of God's people. And so those those have been sort of the, the hallmark of the parish that, that was and hopefully now as we disperse out into the rest of the diocese, we'll be able to take some of that ethos with us and other congregations and yeah. find it there already and help to join with it and make it even greater. So absolutely. And I'm, I'm thinking, I don't know, I mean, it, it's not a visible thing. I mean, it is a visible thing, but you kind of have to know how to look at it, even coming to the best convention. And I know you wrote a Christie's I mean, story very much involved in the generation of St. James. But yep. so, so, you know, it's a way you're being dispersed back out, but also, like, it's to into a diocese that St. James has mm -hmm. very much helped shape. Yeah. Well, and I think it, Episcopalians tend to forget that our, our primary unit as a church is the diocesan unit, and then parishes come are 
provided out of that to provide local emphasis on local service, that we're, we're not a congregational church in that sense that the individual parish is, is predominant. So all of our, our work is diocesan work, and so as we move, we're just going out to do that work in a different a different way, in a different location. Absolutely. So the Diocese of Milwaukee will no longer gather at Ethan, Wisconsin, but it will gather in 52 other places throughout southern Wisconsin and continue to do good work there. Yeah. And I get to have an interesting uh, part of doing that. I've had parish level work. I have some diocesan responsibilities that I've, I've worked with as well. Um, and this will be my fourth trip to general convention as a deputy there. And, um, Hopefully we'll have the same officer assignment to a committee that I had the last time I was there because I really enjoyed the work that I did there. Awesome. And so it's, it's uh, Yeah, I've been told not to expect much out of the weather except that I'm going to melt. <laughs> um, but I'm looking at that as a, a nice weight loss program. I mean, we'll burn off some, some heat calories there. You, you may, so then the food might counterbalance. Uh, It'll be like built in. I have a born in Austin. So, okay. uh, yeah, you just think of all of the sweat as more queso you could eat. Okay. Well, that's one way of looking at it. Yeah. I, one of the things I find fascinating in talking to particularly Episcopal clergy is how much you move around. Yeah. And uh, I'll talk to people who serve here in um, one part of the country and move to another part of the country. Um, I was born in Menominee Falls. I grew up in Brookfield and went to college in Milwaukee, and I worked in Sussex my entire life since a 16 mile radius. Yeah. And so while I, I love that because I know those communities inside and out, and you know people everywhere for those. Um, I'm sort of envious of the, the experiences one gets of moving around the rest of the world and, and having that. So. I think you're there pros and cons, because I, I think on my uh, different days, uh, I long for the ability to just like stay playing a little bit. So, I mean, I, but I, I definitely hear, hear what you're saying. I had an interesting experience coming to this diocese because St. Francis House is its own kind of congregation. We were kind of starting from scratch at the student center and all that. And, had young kids, so worshiping at five o'clock was like not uh, viable at that point. They're older now, so it's easier. Uh, but uh, so we worshiped at St. Andrews, where I was kind of as you're looking to explore, and just Joe Few, like someone with a clergy stewardship talk was aimed at, and someone who could get involved or not. Although there are actually like fewer ways to get involved as a clergy person, because you kind of mess up the vibe. Um, and I found it to be a real gift. It was it was hard. My family had gotten good at getting to church on time without me. <laughs> Coming from a parish where I would get I'd get to church at like seven o'clock, and I had this like blissful hour of quiet talking with the altar girl director and touching base with the musicians and making sure everything's in order. And now I'm just there trying to help them get their shoes, and all of a sudden couldn't make it for the gospel. <laughs> Whoops! So it, it took us a while, but um, I think. I, I, I pray and hope that will be uh, a part of your experience to, 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 to get to be, I mean, I, I don't know, there, there are hard things. I mean, it would take a while to stop noticing the things you would have done differently. Yeah. Well, it, it's not a matter of planning. It's just a matter of cueing. That, right. That all those nonverbal things that other people are unaware of that happen in the service that people who serve a lot know. Um, when I was growing up, I was with the same priest for a long period of time, and it became his primary acolyte. And, would serve with him, particularly anything special that happened or was going to require on the fly service, because he and I were so accused, attuned to one another's nonverbal cues, that he would look over and nod, and I would go and do something, and other people would watch us and go, "How did you even know what he wanted?" Well, that's yeah, that's you know, just gotta, you gotta know how that goes. And after what, yeah. spend enough time together, you work it out. So, uh, and I would miss those kinds of, of relationships um, with Koji until I perhaps had the opportunity to decide if I would to enter into that again, or how I'm enjoying serving in different ways. Yeah. So, well, John, are you, can I ask you our three rapid fire questions? Sure. All right. Question number one What is one thing you would wish Christians would talk more about? Um, about getting to know and understand other denominations. Mm -hmm. um, that we spend a lot of time getting to know ourselves and our own histories really well and forget that other people have valuable things to teach us out of their histories. And so, one of the the things I miss from my youth is the congregation I grew up in we used to do uh, denominational exchanges. We would go and worship with another community on the weekend, and they would come back and worship with us, and we'd meet and talk about our experiences. Yeah. And that was a really wonderful thing. I really felt that was a very formative 
uh, Nick when I was younger. I think that would be something I would try to talk more about. So important to add is someone on campus, like the young adults I interact with, don't sue denominational loyalty at all the way we did. I think there's something prophetic to what you're trying to see. Um, what is a practice, I'll call it a spiritual practice, but not something necessarily you want to church would be in. It's a practice you think Christians would do well to rediscover and or explore. Uh, service. That, uh, that getting your butt up out of your chair and actually extending a hand to try and help somebody or do something is really hard the first time you do it. But once you've gotten past the first part, then serving just snowballs, it gets a whole lot easier. Mm. Um, I was not naturally a very extroverted person, but um, probably the person who approached me had been the person who approached the most newcomers at St. James simply because a past director required it of me. And I would have to come and report out how many people I had approached in the course of a, a day and one conversations have gone and I would get conversational tips on how to do that better the next time and sure enough every time got better and um, now it frustrates my kids to no end because I will do that no matter where I am <laughs> even if we're in the middle of a target parking lot you know and it's good. I will put the open my car up tell the kids wait a minute and I'll walk across the aisle to help the old lady who's trying to get her cat litter out of her cart while standing at her walker and just doesn't have hands enough for those things and that un, un it's not uncommon for that to be a 10 minute conversation at that point. My kids are going, come on, Dad, we want to go home. Yeah. Um, but that wasn't me. And I, I, if we get up and make that effort and try and look for opportunities to do what we can for those we can because we can, then that would be a good thing for us. Uh, that's, that's really important for folks to hear. Um, last question. Uh, Carl Hart one time said, you heard me say this. Oh, the laughter right? question. Yeah. Uh, that laughter is the closest thing to the grace of God. What makes you laugh? Uh, uh, actually, I make me laugh uh, a great <laughs> deal. And part of that is tied to uh, high school. There's plenty of opportunities to do things that are embarrassing in front of high school kids and not even realize it. And when they start to giggle and I ask them to say why they're giggling and they tell me, it's good. And rather than getting red faced about it or anything else, like, we'll join in and go, yeah, you're right, that was awfully darn funny. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and that can lead to some of my, my best relationship building with them and uh, good talking points with them. And I find that being able to laugh at myself is perhaps some of the, the best ways to do it. And it's interesting because I mean, you do teaching with theater and I'm like, yeah, I'm, a, I'm the least Englishly, Englishy English teacher you're ever likely to encounter. So okay. um, I work with theater, I work with radio, television, film production, I work with technical writing, um, social justice literature. Uh, I'm a media mentor for a robotics team, so I'm a little bit of a uh, so, I, so I have a podcasting class, actually. So, uh, I actually get pointers. No, no, you should not. It's <laughs> part of the reason I came in, to see what happens with other people. So, um, you're scouting us out. That's good. I mean, we don't have a podcast yet. We're just doing web webcasting, but I'm hoping to add in 2017, which we have to launch. Got it. So, it's, and, and really, the, someone asked me the other day, who's your audience? I know that's a really important question. For me, it's more about developing habits of talking to friends in my life. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what's what's going to be. A couple of people have come in and talked about like laughing at, at themselves, but you were talking about like when other people occasionally the laughter. I think when, when when that gets set, like in a church setting, people think about the importance of humility or self-deprecating and stuff like that. But in theater, I mean, I'm thinking there's a there's a great it's a theology ethics book by Sam Wells that's called Improvisation, and it's stealing theater work for for Christian ethics. And he talks about the importance of over accepting sort of you have givens and you can block it, you can accept it, you can over accept it. And what it's like to be uh, a lot of the things that Stephen Colbert talks about in the commencement address to uh, where he talks about you cannot win your life. Your best bet is to become one of the players known for the generosity of playing with them. Um, and, and to discover that we don't have to sort of win whatever we came in, even if we thought we were coming in open. Thing, uh, we realized, oh no, I actually had something that got wounded in that moment, but that doesn't have to be the last part of the scene. Well, hey, thank you for coming in. This is wonderful.